Hi, everyone. I'm Margie O'Brien. Welcome to Open House, a new program here on Capital TV. We're hoping to address some of the important issues before the General Assembly right now. Joining me this morning is Nicholas Mattiello, Speaker of the House. Thanks for being here. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Margie. Now, I know one of the talkers all week on the floor in the committees was about the charter schools, the mayoral academies, and the funding formula. This is a big topic right now. It's, it's, it's a contemporary topic. It's an important topic for our education system. And it's great to have an opportunity to discuss the bills that are before the, the House and the bills, the issues that we're considering, and try to have a conversation with the public and just inform the public of the things that we are handling that affect them, that are important to them, and what our reasoning is for some of these uh, decisions that we make. So it's great to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. It sounds great. And we have some wonderful guests joining us. If we can head down this way, Representative Jeremiah O'Grady, Lincoln and Pawtucket. Right. Representative Patricia Serpa, West Warwick, Coventry and Warwick. Correct. And Representative Greg Amori from East Providence. Correct. Thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. So why don't we start with you, Patricia Ladies Serpa. first. Ladies first. Um, you had a very passionate talk on the floor the other night. Do you want to sort of recap what you said and why you're feeling that strongly about this? Sure. Um, West Warwick has rather become the poster child for a local town council being t caught totally unaware that a mayoral academy was planned for the Kent County re region. And the reason why that's significant is because we were just compromised and put into a five-year fiscal stability act. It was a five-year plan to get us out of our financial morass. Our municipal pension was in critical status. And frankly, Rosemary Booth Gologoli was this close to putting us into bankruptcy. To fast forward and make a very long story short, our town manager negotiated with the unions, uh, got some concessions, and in fact, the teachers donated millions of dollars to the municipal, municipal pension fund to which they never contributed a dime. That was significant. So we had some agreements from the unions. Uh, we, we put those agreements to an all-day vote, an all-day referendum in town, and that referendum included some tax increases for ourselves. The taxpayers agreed that this is the way we wanted to move our community forward to avoid bankruptcy or receivership. The ink was no sooner dry on that agreement, Margie. A month later, we hear word that a mayoral academy is proposed for Kent County. I got a call, I'm not proud to say it, from a, a council person who was totally unaware that it had been on the fast track. And he said, Pat, if this thing goes, the five-year plan we just signed, rip it up, throw it away, it's into bankruptcy we go. Because as you know with the funding formula, the money follows the child. So if in West Warwick it's $15,000 per student to educate a child, and say 10 children, 20 children leave the West Warwick Public Schools to go to this mayoral academy, that money goes with them. And West Warwick is currently counting on every single dollar, every single state and municipal tax dollar to make this five-year plan work. So I submitted a local control bill, frankly, to help myself in my town, but frankly for the, for the other towns, too, who could be caught unawares when the local elected officials have no say. They work so hard to develop this plan to have it fall flat in front of them. It really would have been a, a financial disaster for my town. And, and if, if I may, Representative, your town asked you to put the bill in. Absolutely. It was, it was based on fiscal consideration and, and no other consideration. No other consideration. Do you recall what the gross monetary loss would have been to your town or what they uh, expected it could be? Actually, speak. I think if that mayoral academy had gone forward, it would have been a million dollars a year out of our tax base. At full in implementation of this planned academy, a million a year out of the local tax base. So if we can break it down to its least common denominator, your bill says that the town of West Warwick or any town would have some input in whether or not a mayoral academy or a charter school goes into that community and they suffer that type of loss. And they make a determination as to whether it's best for their education system or not. Correct. and whether they can afford it or not. Correct, Speaker. They're the ones paying the bills for the taxpayers in West Warwick. So, frankly, I think that our local elected officials should have some say in how they're entrusted to spend the local and, frankly, the tax dollar. And your local officials were not aware of any other sources of revenue or any option short of bankruptcy had they lost that $1 million. For months and months, Speaker, they looked at every alternative. And as I said, Rosemary Booth Gologli 
lost her patience with us and said, do it or I'm doing it for you. So we, we did this plan, and, and it's working. I'm, I'm happy to say it's working. So to disrupt it now, we're right back to square one. And there's no alternative. We'll be in bankruptcy. And I'm hearing your story that the teachers were part of the solution to get you out of the problem. Imagine if the academy had opened and their money was going with the students. And that's exactly The backlash that would have happened. That's exactly what would have happened. And right you had here. a model. So you have a model in place with, with Cumberland and Lincoln to see that the money does not get replaced. Because in the infancy of the charter movement, the idea was that there'd be no economic impact. But, but when you have kids leaving who are spread out over grades, you still have the classrooms running, you still have the teachers running, you still have the transportation, you still have the heat, you still have the electricity. They can't close classrooms. And, and we've seen the model in Lincoln and Cumberland. And so, so therefore, it made perfect sense for uh, Representative Serpa to put that forward because she knew what the financial impact was going to be. So essentially, a community or a school district sets a budget, they account for all of their dollars, and then they, they start losing money when the money follows the child. So for every child they lose, they lose X number of dollars, um, and you multiply for the sum total. But since those children are spread out through different classes, you, you, you don't lay off a teacher, and you have right. the same number of classrooms. So really, your costs are the same. So even though the money follows the child, that school district has to pay the same exact expense dollars though and and they, there's no relief with that that's, that's, that's correct and that yeah. doesn't even get into the fact that the students that are left behind are pro primarily harder to educate because it's a higher special education uh, group it's a, a poorer group um, and so you're taking resources away from the kids that need the most and the issue that that the speaker just raised uh, is one that was really central in the house special study commission that I chaired last uh, spring uh, and that Greg was a member of. Um, and it was also covered uh, pretty extensively uh, in an article that, that we submitted as part of that record, which is from the Moody's Investor Service that uh, entitled Charter Schools Pose Growing Risk for Urban Public School Districts. And Moody's is a bond rating agency. They don't really weigh in on education policy, but they saw the growing uh, use of, of charter schools as um, really a financial threat to the underlying districts. And uh, directly to the speaker's point, our funding formula is based on the premise that the funding follows the child. Uh, and the implication there is that the expenses also file, follow the child in, in lockstep. Um, but the evidence that was presented to us during that study commission by uh, a number of superintendents that came before us was that, in fact, while some expenses have the potential of following a child to a charter school when they opt for that placement, a tremendous amount of fixed costs stay behind to be borne by the diminished revenues that remain in the district. So to give a Lincoln example, and I'm here representing mostly Lincoln, 90 percent of my district, uh, in, in, uh, in year, uh, fiscal year 15, just speaking about the mayoral academy that, that pulls from, from our district, we had 158 students that went to that, uh, that charter uh, for a total local share tuition expense of $1.8 million. Um, the district realized savings of $398,000 due to the departure of those children from our, uh, our, stu uh, from our school, leaving be, uh, behind a fixed cost premium or stranded cost burden of about $1.4 million. Um, that story was repeated in Cumberland, where the stranded cost burden was $1.4 million as well, in North Kingstown with an $800,000 stranded cost burden, and in Coventry, where um, they're looking at uh, your district uh, as well, they're looking at about a four hundred and seventy-five. Uh, $1,000 strain of cost burden for just 55 students. So you multiply this across the towns, um, and you're really seeing a, a, the creation of, of parallel systems um, and replicated infrastructure, replicated services, at the same time that our constituents are demanding a consolidation of services. That's, so. that's been one of my concerns, Representative. I mean, we have a lot of structural problems that we, we've been dealing with as a General Assembly for years since I've been elected. And as we move forward, I try not to create further structural problems in the future, and we seem to be creating parallel education systems that compete for the same exact tax dollars. So rather than have one premier system or one system that's great or good that we can support, we're causing challenges in, in of the two parallel systems. And it's just going to be a structural problem for the future uh, is, is my concern right now. So I believe you have legislation pending before us that considers the fiscal impact of, of a proposed school. Can you, can you explain that to us? I, 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 I would be happy to, uh, Speaker. Just as um, uh, Representative Serpa mentioned that, 
that uh, West Warwick was perhaps the poster child of a council being caught flat-footed. I, I would submit that Lincoln is the poster child for um, the un an unanticipated expenses of charter expansion. Um, so when uh, the Mayoral Academy that, that pulls from, from Lincoln was first established back in uh, 2009 with um, you know, a small introductory all-day K class of 16 students pulled from our district, it was a very minimal uh, tuition impact to the town. And in fact, the town's entire charter tuition bill uh, in 2009 was $145,000. Well, you go six years later, and the charter tuition bill, uh, uh, I'm sorry, it was $237,000 in Lincoln in 2009. You go f uh, forward six years, and our charter tuition bill fiscal year 15 is $1.8 million. How many grades have been added? Uh, well, a grade has been added each, each year. Each year. Yep, okay. and that you know, tends to, obviously, that, that exponentially increases sure. the cost burden. Um, so we're looking at a 691% increase uh, in, in the tuition expenditure. Um, which, uh, you know, is, is unsustainable, I submit, over time. Um, so what my bill does is it requires um, that the Council of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education consider financial impact like this as part of their charter, charter approval process. Um, we saw last year when the RISE Mayoral Academy was approved in, in, uh, uh, in Woonsocket, pulling from Woonsocket, North Smithfield, uh, Burrowville, and um, Cumberland, that um, there was no attention paid to the financial impact. In fact, attempts to have financial impact were, were, uh, were rejected as being not appropriate for the discussion. So what my bill does is simply, it says what we do here, everything we do here as public servants considers financial impact, they ought to as well. So, so just for a little, I'm sorry, just for a little background though, in the past when these schools wanted to establish themselves, what was the protocol for approval? Could they just say, I'd like to open a new school here? Well, I believe the Department of Education has a process, and, and I don't know the specifics of the process. They hold public hearings. They, they consider the need, I believe, and so forth. But one of the things, it's interesting, they do not consider fiscal impact. And I know that request has been made, and they basically said it's irrelevant. It's up to the local community to find a way to get it done. If we, if we approve it, they have to fund it. It, this, this seems to be a disconnect in that, and, and your bill seems to be addressing a need. You know, what's interesting is as we're talking about this, there's a lot of policy considerations when, when you're, you're talking about charter schools, and f different folks have different opinions, and oftentimes I, I rely upon the expertise of Ride and, and so forth, uh, but even, even over there there's a lot of different opinions. But the analysis that you're putting forth is not subject to any type of philosophical educational analysis. It's just financial. Moody's is not an educational institution, and they don't care if we build more schools, less schools, charters, or traditional public schools. They just look at the fiscal consideration, and they raise a red flag and say, be careful, we're creating structures that are going to hurt communities in the future, so be mindful of that. At least they're watching it. I think that's true, and, and I think one of the... One of the things that the study commission tried very hard to do last year was stick to objective data as much as we could. Um, and in fact, we relied, uh, the only data that we used was data presented to us by RIDE from their uniform chart of accounts, or UCOA data, which showed, in addition to these stranded cost issues that I've mentioned, um, disparities in expenditure burdens related to out-of-district special ed placements, um, special ed spending generally, uh, uh, career and technical education tuitions, uh, early intervention services for at-risk three- to five-year-olds, uh, post-graduation services for developmentally disabled young adults between 18 and 21. There is a whole host of additional expenditures um, that are either exclusively or primarily borne by local districts that drive up their expenditure profile relative to charters that proportionally have fewer of those expenses. And you know, Speaker, to your earlier point in response to one of Rep. O'Grady's comments, um, you asked him they're not closing schools as these charter schools, not closing public schools or public schools classrooms. No, they're not. So if two or three kids leave from a second grade or a third grade or a fifth grade, they don't close down those classrooms. But as they lose their thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, guess what they cut? They cut programs. 
music, advanced programs, art, advanced mm -hmm. programs, football, right. sports, all of the things that enrich the lives of our kids. And some of those very things keep kids in school. Yeah, sure. And if, if I understand correctly, at least 95, more than 95 percent of our children are being educated in Correct. the traditional public schools. So right. 95 percent of the children are educated in the school systems that are forced to cut the advanced programs, the arts, the sports, and so forth, uh, so that we can give a premier education to two to four percent of our students. Right. Correct. And while, and while Rep. Serp is right, the traditional schools are not closing, but uh, uh, national uh, trends indicate that Catholic schools are closing. And what, what a recent study has found is that a third of charter school students would have been private school students, mostly parochial school students. And this has caught the attention of Bishop Tobin and the Providence Diocese because they're now taking a hard line on the leases of their buildings to the mayoral academies because they know that that's a competitive system for theirs. So the claim originally by charters was we're going to set up incubators of innovation and then we're going to share that innovation with the public schools and we're going to create a better public school system. What has developed, especially with the mayorals, is is basically the same type of school system, only it's uh, uh, it looks like a private school. And that's why this study, and it's a national trend, so I assume it, it's happened here in uh, Ro Rhode Island as well, where, where parents were considering uh, a parochial education, and they decided to get themselves in the lottery. And if they won the lottery, then that was great. They could get themselves in there and not pay. Uh, and and that's, that's significant because... We weren't, we weren't educating those students for years. So it's even a greater loss than we're talking about as far as the money following the child. So if, if uh, uh, Speaker Mattiello's son went to LaSalle, the, the state uh, money did not go to Cranston. Sure. Uh, but but the, the local money did not go to LaSalle. The local money stayed. And so if this, if this holds true, and I believe it is true, um, then you're, we, there's a bigger impact than we even anticipated when they first uh, opened. And the reciprocal programs that were supposed to happen are not happening. They're starting, they're starting, we're starting to see it because I believe they feel pressure uh, to, to start to present some of these programs. But the reality is, and I've heard the speaker say this, you've, you, you've created a, a college preparatory model. It doesn't look any different than the model in Cumberland, the model in West Warwick, the model in East Providence. And in fact, we saw evidence last year that when you, when you accounted for the special education differences, and there are significant differences, that the, the town of Cumberland and the town of, uh, of Lincoln and the town of West Warwick were actually outperforming the charter schools. So, so this, is a, this is complex, but I think there were unintended consequences that have developed over the course of these many years. When we first did the charter school experiment, I think everybody agreed that that's a good idea because we want to innovate. We want to have an incubator. We want to have an experimental school. But, but today, the financial impact has overwhelmed that. So we have the fiscal considerations um, that nobody's considering, and Representative O'Grady, your, your, your bill wants us to do that, and, and from your perspective, Representative Serpa, you want the town to have an input. If they're going to have to contribute more money, let's at least make sure they can and, and want to contribute uh, to a parallel or different system. Um, it, it seems like that makes logical sense. I mean. It's very democratic. Have you heard any specific objections to, to those ideas other than, you know, what I hear a lot is the charter schools do a great job. And I have no reason to disagree with that. I, I do believe they do so, and I've always supported charter schools. But um, other than they do a great job, my concern is the 95-plus percent that is left in the traditional school and I want to make sure they have sports and arts and, and com competitive programs, advanced programs. And I've always believed, uh, since the first day of my public service uh, and, and long before that, that every child in the state of Rhode Island deserves the same opportunity and they, they have the right to have access to a great education. So uh, I'm not sure how you justify having children uh, being forced to go to a school without good conditions, without advanced programs, without arts, without sports. You, you have one shot at, at your education when you're young um, so that you could give a different education to 2 to 4 percent of the students. I, nobody has been able to explain to me how you justify that. Have you heard any 
reasonable justifications to, to support that type of an approach? I've been questioned about it, Speaker, but when you lift the blanket and people have the simplistic view that, oh, well, you can just close down the classroom and get rid of the teacher, and it's, it looks that way on the surface, but when you lift up the blanket and explain to them what I just said to you about cutting the art, cutting the music, cutting football, cutting girls' softball, they take a pause and they go, oh, I didn't realize. I said, so are you happy with that? Because some of the best lessons you'll agree, I learned outside of the classroom. So if we don't have those opportunities for kids and everything is with the books and on the computer, we're really shortchanging that 95%. And that's assuming you're not shortchanging them uh, or the system is not shortchanging them at advanced class, advanced that placement too. calculus. Because those, those are low student population classes. Mm -hmm. right? And a district like mine in these problems, we have to... We have to struggle to make sure that we run a calculus, an advanced placement calculus. And that may have nine students. Well, when you look at the, the student-to-teacher ratio, they say, well, you have a class running there for nine students. Yes, but those are advanced students who have earned their way into that advanced placement class. We need to serve them just as well as we serve everybody else. And I would imagine that parents are feeling that if these classes and choices get taken off their plate, they would be more interested in sending their children to the charter schools, which might be a domino effect. If they yes, could get in. I understand it's a lottery system, absolutely. so if they could get in. But say if you have a high schooler that's extremely bright and needs that pre-calculus class, and it's not available at your high school, but it might be available at the mayoral academy down the street, you might think differently. We saw that with, with um, all-day kindergarten. That was sure. one of the great appeals of the mayorals, was that they offered all-day kindergarten when the sending districts could not afford to. It was interesting during testimony uh, in finance the other night when we were hearing your bill, uh, Tim Ryan from the Superintendents Association, he acknowledged that many, when he talked to parents, why are you choosing to put your child's name in the lottery, so many parents said to him, because they have after-school child care. What a luxury sure. to be able to finish your academics at 2.30, 3 o'clock, but to have babysitting services till 5.30, 6 o'clock. Or even if it's extended education, it's still something that the sending district can't afford, particularly with the continued erosion of the, of the support. And I, I think it's worth pointing out that it is a lottery. I mean, it's not a choice. I've heard when we've had flawed debates, I've heard uh, the argument that if you choose to go to a charter school or a mayoral academy, um, that is a totally different argument than it's a lottery and only 2 to 4% of our students uh, go there. So you can choose to want to be in the lottery, but the question I've always asked is if you choose to want to be in the lottery and you, you don't get selected um, because the demand uh, outpaces the number of spaces available, you're, you're, you're left behind in the, tradi the traditional system. So not only do you not get your choice, but the traditional system that you're left behind in is not going to have the programming that may, may serve your needs. So you, you, you lose out twice on that. And, and you, you know, the, the, I think uh, we have to keep in mind that it's not a choice, and, and there's absolutely no choice. It's, it's a lottery with uh, very few people getting into the charters. They, they only, uh, in the mayoral academies, they only educate 2 to 4 percent of our total children. And that, and that population does not reflect, in, and especially in the urban districts, it does not reflect the sending district. We know through our study that there are more reduced lunch students in the, in the mayorals especially, but in charters in general, than there are free lunch students. We know that the, ed the special education needs of the charter students are far less than those in the traditional uh, publics. And so the clientele, for lack of a better word, is easier to educate. And so we, what's left behind is the clientele that is difficult to educate, sure. but with less resources. And I think, I think fundamentally, to speak directly to the, the speaker's point, I think fundamentally people don't actually crave a choice. I think fundamentally they crave a guarantee that the education their child is going to get is the best education that we as a state can offer them. And I believe that the creation of this parallel system with the disproportionate cost burdens undermines our ability to provide that guarantee. Um, for all the reasons that you've mentioned and all the reasons that we've discussed here. so That's a good point. And that's my concern with the parallel system. You're treating children in the, the different systems disproportionately, and you can't choose which one to go to. And ultimately, we're going to create a structure that we can't support someday in the future. And even if you can scrape the money together today, 
there's going to come a point when they both fail miserably because we don't have the resources to support two systems. And that's something that we have to think about before we create the structures. Because once you create them, as, as, you, as you well know, very hard to uncreate something that's, that's operating. It's and on a social note, is there some sort of um, animosity or maybe that's a little too strong a word, but is there a, a difference in the communities when children are sent to the charter schools? Because maybe perhaps you're losing the parents that are more involved in their kids because they got their names in the lottery in the first place. And the districts are moving, losing out on the, having those parents as part of their PTA members or their community. You're right. And, and in addition to that, those students are leaving and so are their test scores. So then the argument is the test score from the sending district continue to go down because they're losing their best students. And the charter said, well, well we're, we have high test scores here. That's, that school's failing. So it's a, it's a cycle that just continues. And in fact, my, my bill addresses that point. So my bill requires RIDE to uh, consider the financial impact of a charter uh, expansion or establishment on a sending district and to return uh, findings of fact concerning whether or not there will be a detrimental financial impact and or a detrimental educational impact. And when pressed on this in, in committee the other night, well, what do you mean by that? I meant exactly that. Uh, if you are establishing a new school in a system characterized by selection bias, by you know, requiring active parents to get their children into the lottery and only active parents, um, then w there is an impact on test scores and on the, uh, on the um, uh, you know, the, the profiles of the schools that are, that are left behind. We have just a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to see if maybe you could just recap your individual bills to show the similarities and also the differences. Well, I'll, I'll go first, and mine again is just local control. Our five town council people were elected by the democracy to dedicate our budget to necessary resources in the town. Education consumes most of our resources, so I just feel that it's fair for my town council, his town council, every town council, if they're charged with paying the bill, Margie, they really should have a say before a charter or a mayoral academy comes into town. And Representative Grady. Yep, very simple. It requires uh, the Council of Elementary and Secondary Education to consider financial impact in the case of a um, uh, expansion uh, of a charter beyond already approved levels and or establishment of a new one and to return affirmative findings of fact related to uh, detrimental impacts both financially and educationally. Well, as we said, it was a talker. Absolutely. Last thought, Speaker. Well, my last thoughts are these are important issues. We'll take them up. They're in committee again next week. And these are important issues because education is critical. It's one of the pillars to a robust, healthy community in the future. And the decisions we make uh, will keep first and foremost uh, in our thoughts what's best for every child, and we'll do our best to provide a great educational opportunity for every child in our school system. Great. All right. Well, thank you all. This was a great thank conversation. You. Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, Representative Jeremiah O'Grady, Representative Patricia Serpa and Representative Greg Amori, thank you joint for joining us for the first episode of Open House. Looking thank you, Margie. To doing it again. I hope so. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. Thank you for all your service. Always. And thank you for joining us for this episode of Open House. I'm Margie O'Brien for Capital TV. We'll see you again soon.